So uh, welcome everybody, uh, on behalf of uh, my colleague Professor Jonathan Grigg, uh, welcome to Bart's Medical School, QMUL, uh, and uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's my huge pleasure and honour to uh, welcome uh, Professor Jim Gowderman to uh, give this public lecture uh, this afternoon. Uh, Jim is a collaborator with us on uh, a pollution study that uh, uh, we've just submitted for funding. Jim is uh, a world leader, and we're really honoured that he's here because uh, of that. Uh, he's uh, carried out some of the most important and influential studies on the topic of uh, air pollution and its health effects on children's growth and development. So his work is hugely relevant to us uh, in London as we enter uh, not our first, but our second imminent low emission zone. Probably, I don't know how many, stud how many towns and cities across the world are onto their second low emission zone, but uh, London has that, uh, that honour. So the questions about uh, how and to what extent air quality uh, adversely affects particularly the growth of children's lungs uh, are hugely, that's a hugely important question for us in London and I'm sure is a concern uh, of uh, a lot of you who have attended today. Jim has published widely on this topic um, and he's uh, carried out studies which uh, tell us something about uh, how much adverse effect air pollution has on children's development but also how much improvement uh, can uh, occur if pollution is subsequently reduced. So uh, Jim is uh, supremely qualified to uh, uh, talk to us uh, this evening. So I'll hand over to Jim. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Chris. <coughs> Thank you for that uh, very nice introduction. Thanks for having me here. Uh, thanks to Lynette for organizing uh, me getting here. And thanks to all of you for showing up on a Friday afternoon. I was just telling him that this kind of attendance probably would not happen in Los Angeles. Um, Everybody would be off to the beach on a nice summer evening, probably. So it's, it's really a pleasure to come here. Um, to hear about your, your low emission zone uh, work here, the, the potential for improved air quality in the city, and to share a little bit about what we've been seeing in Los Angeles over the past 25 years or so of conducting uh, the children's health study. And particularly uh, towards the end, I'll talk about what's happened in California with air quality trends and, and what we've been able to observe in terms of health effects that have emerged from that. So if you go back to 1948, Los Angeles, uh, downtown looked something like this. You can barely make out there the city hall. Um, it was, uh, you know, on a clear day, should look like this. And so it was, uh, it was pretty bad air, air quality back then, and it continued to uh, be bad through the 50s and 60s and, and 70s. Um, this was uh, published in the LA Times. Some concerned citizen put this up overnight, apparently. Uh, and when we started this study back in the 90s, there, there was some thought about, you know, d don't we already know pollution is bad for us? There had been a lot of uh, early studies looking at acute effects, um, chamber studies, and short-term kinds of effect studies. Uh, but the thing that kind of distinguished uh, our work and, and why we got into this was to try to look at longer-term health effects, uh, day in and day out breathing of the kinds of polluted air that we have in Los Angeles. Uh, and things like increased uh, asthma risks, changes in lung function, physician visits, those kinds of things were, were of interest to us. And not much was really known about whether pollution was having those kind of longer term health effects back in the early 90s. Uh, so asthma risk, lung function, those kinds of things that I just mentioned. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the children's health study today, the basic design. Uh, I'll focus a lot on how it has affected lung function growth and what we've seen is the air has gotten cleaner. This was originally a 10-year study funded by the California Air Resources Board um, and it got, grew such a nice cohort we were starting to see some interesting things that we were able to apply for additional funding primarily from NIH and specifically NIEHS but a variety of other funding agencies as well have, have uh, funded parts of this study. Lots of people starting with the original principal investigator John Peters who had the vision for, for starting this study. So if you looked at the original six hypotheses, I won't ask you to read these, they basically break down into uh, asking what is air pollution doing, who is most affected, 
which, pollution, which pollutant is doing it, <coughs> and how much does it take to do it. And that was kind of the basic roadmap that we had starting out uh, this, this study. So the basic goal then was to find California communities that had a broad range of pollution profile, recruit volunteers and somehow measure their health and measure that health over several years. It was planned from the beginning to be a multi-year longitudinal study. Concurrently measure air pollution exposure so that we had good timing of air quality data with the lung function and the other health outcome measure. And then obviously see whether changes in health were related to changes in air quality. So if you've never been to Southern California, uh, it's a very uh, dense place. There's a lot of activity going on down here at the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. A lot of diesel truck traffic that emanates from those ports carries the loads out to the rest of the country. So very heavily impacted areas of truck traffic as well as obviously vehicle traffic, automobile traffic. And with a prevailing onshore breeze, the afternoons in the inland valleys look something like this and are typically the most polluted places in, in the states. High levels of ozone, nitrogen dioxide, and PM out in those valleys. So we wanted to capitalize then on obviously the high pollution. That was going to be our exposed kids. Um, so we recruited from four cohort, I'm sorry, four communities in those inland valleys as well as the port city of Long Beach. And then we went up north to get some kind of low pollution control communities. So we started air monitoring one site in each community, continuous monitoring since 1994 for ozone, PM, PM10, PM2.5, and NO2. So as I said, kind of low pollution up here, high pollution in this area, and then some kind of mid-level communities that were in some cases high in ozone but low in particles and NO2 and, and the reverse to try and get some ability to tease apart that question about which pollutant might be the bad actor. So if you look over a, a long period of time, this is what the distributions of long-term NO2, PM, et cetera, look like. And I'll highlight NO2 just as an example. These are those five high pollution communities. And you can see f that we definitely captured a cluster of communities that were much higher pollution than our lower pollution communities. But you can also tell that all of these pollutants have pretty much the same kind of a trend. So if you kind of look at the broad picture, those five communities are high in NO2, they're high in PM, et cetera. And the only signature that's really different is ozone. So we had kind of an ability to distinguish ozone from the other pollutants right out of the gate. But aside from that, not a lot of ability, as you'll see, to kind of distinguish effects within this box. So why study kids? Well, I don't think I have to tell the group here that. Uh, more time outdoors, more active, higher ventilation rates, less additional potential confounders. We hope that they're not taking up smoking. And indeed, for the most part, uh, very few of our kids report active smoking. There's, of course, environmental tobacco smoke exposure. But the other real big thing for us was we knew where to find them. We could get to them in the schools. We could go in and recruit whole classrooms of kids and have pretty regular access to them on a, on a yearly basis. So we started out with about 3,600 kids or so back in 1994, 1993. They were either in 10th grade, 7th grade, or 4th grade at the time. This is average about 10 years of age in the 4th graders. And the original 10-year design of the study was to follow that 4th grade cohort through their graduation out of 12th grade and then have a little bit of time at the end of that to do the analysis. So that was kind of the parameters of that initial 10-year study. Um, we started out with about 4,800 kids that were contacted, about 76% recruitment rate. So we had about 25, 24% that, that didn't want to participate. At that time, the uh, majority were uh, white, and we had a fairly large Hispanic contingent and very small proportions of Asian and African American. We collected annually a lot of cofactor kinds of information in addition to an extensive baseline questionnaire. We had annual questions that got updated information on respiratory illnesses, environmental tobacco smoke, pets, and other kinds of potential confounding factors that might be related to these health outcomes. So early on, Rob McConnell, one of my <coughs> colleagues, published a paper showing that within asthmatics, there was a pretty clear association between the level of particulate matter
in the community that the child was living in, and the proportion of kids with bronchitic symptoms. So obviously higher proportions of bronchitic symptoms in asthmatic kids than in non-asthmatic kids, but a pretty clear trend of increasing bronchitic symptoms in those living in the higher uh, PM communities and not really much of a trend at all in the non-asthmatic kids. So before I go on, I'm going I'm to tell you we added along the way with extra funding two additional cohorts. There was cohort D. This is another cohort of fourth grade kids that we recruited when our first 12th grade cohort graduated. And then a few years later, we started a very large cohort of over 5,000 kids. And we started them a bit earlier because we wanted to try to see what was going on earlier in the life cycle. So they started as kindergartners, and they have now since graduated a couple years back. Annual measurements of lung function, these were done in the schools. So here's an example of a child being coached by the field tech to blow as hard as they possibly can and measuring FEV, FEC, et cetera. So the first time we looked at lung function in relation to air quality was after four years of follow-up in the first two cohorts. And at that point, we saw some what we thought were fairly interesting signals. So two fourth grade cohorts, two separate papers, uh, both of them showing associations between lung function growth over that four-year period, and this is in percent growth, relative to NO2, coarse particles, fine particles, and inorganic acid. And you can see in general the trends are pretty uh, consistent and replicated in the second cohort compared to the first cohort. Again, most strongly linked to that kind of package of pollutants that I showed you early on, including NO2 and PM. We saw larger effects in more outdoor kids, so we stratified the kids by whether they reported spending more or less time outdoors. And we saw those effects on the prior page when we separated them out within the two cohorts. We saw, in general, somewhat larger detrimental effects in the kids that reported spending more time outdoors, ostensibly breathing whatever was in those communities. So that was after four years. Um, the first time we took a look at the full eight-year follow-up was when cohort C, that first cohort of fourth graders that we recruited, uh, graduated from high school. So we published that paper back in 2004. We had about 1,800 kids. We had about six, a little over six measurements per kid. So not too bad. We would have liked to have gotten as many as nine, uh, eight years, the ends give you nine as, as the maximum. So we got about maybe two thirds of what we would have liked to get, but of course kids leave during the study and we have some attrition. This is kind of generally what the lung function patterns look like. So this is all the measurements we took in girls and all the measurements we took in boys. You can see the obvious growth spurt in girls, timed a little bit earlier than it is in boys. And by the time the girls reach age 18, they're pretty much plateauing on their lung development. Boys getting close to that plateau point, still growing very slowly. On average, both boys and girls start out with about two liters of FEV1 at fourth grade. And you can see that after uh, eight years, the girls have added about 1.3 liters. The boys more than doubled that. So the key question, obviously, is not do kids grow uh, or by how much. It's whether eight-year growth is related to the air that they've been breathing over that period. So we uh, developed over that time some statistical models to be timed to go along with this to make sure that we were capturing the multi-level nature of how we were collecting data, multiple measurements per kid, multiple kids per community, the potential to look at air pollution effects kind of on a child-specific basis, looking at traffic effects and community pollution levels, and we wanted to be able to capture all of those things. Now, a key to this was how we were going to model these data and take into account the nonlinearity. And that actually spent a, a while trying to figure out how to do that, how to come out with the right parameterization so that we could fit this multi-level model. And I had the good fortune to be able to sit with the uh, lead author of this paper here, who had done a very similar kind of nonlinear modeling um, related to CD4 counts and survival in people with HIV. So she sat with me 
worked out the math for that first level and that really helped uh, put that model together. So when we brought that all together and looked at how lung function growth over eight years was related to NO2, we saw a pretty substantial and statistically significant trend with kids in the more polluted places having lower eight-year lung function growth on the average of about 100 milliliters reduction if you take the lowest pollution to the highest pollution. Now that's the number I just showed you here for NO2 and FEV and you can see that in this blue highlighted area we're seeing significant effects similar sized for all of those kinds of pollutants that I pointed out up front, that package of pollutants that includes NO2 and PM10, PM2.5, etc. So again, not a real ability to answer that one of our original questions, which pollutant is, is causing the problems, although we consistently, you can see, are seeing effects with these what we call traffic-related pollutants, uh, less so and, and nothing statistically significant has popped up for us between lung function and ozone. So of course, you know, the first thing we do is get excited when we see things like this. The second thing we do is ask, well, what else could be causing this? And so we have a lot of this additional questionnaire data. We essentially threw the kitchen sink at this to try and make it go away, hoping it wouldn't go away, and indeed it, it did not. So it was very robust to adjustment for all kinds of indoor pollutants, SES factors, including parental education, parental income, race, ethnicity, et cetera. Um, we stratified the data by gender, by asthma status, smokers, non-smokers, we saw pretty consistent effects in all of those subgroups and not in, no evidence that this was just focused on one small subgroup. So remember we'd been following kids for eight years. Lung function is pretty much plateaued in boys and girls by the time they reach age 18, so we thought it was a good point to ask the question, well, you know, what are the net effects as, as these kids transition into adulthood of breathing whatever they've been breathing over that eight-year period? Um, where are they at at that point at age 18? And are they clinically meaningful? So we computed at that point what we would expect FEV to be based on age, sex, race, et cetera. We then looked at each child's observed FEV at that point as a ratio of what we would expect. And we categorized kids as being low FEV if their observed to expected ratio was below 80%. So the question then is eight years of breathing pollution related to clinically low lung function. And this was the plot that we saw. So in those five high pollution communities, you can see that as many as over 9% of the kids had abnormally low lung function at age 18. And most interestingly, I think, all five of those high pollution communities had higher proportions of kids with low lung function compared to our lower pollution communities. Now, I pointed out before, we have this kind of package of pollutants, and sure enough, that same trend holds. So if we come back to this plot, we can't really pin the blame on PM 2.5, although that's on the x-axis here. We can at most say abnormally low lung function is likely in a more polluted community with that caveat that we're not exactly sure which of those pollutants is the bad actor. So uh, again, I probably don't have to tell this group why we care about low lung function. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of work that's been done in later in life linking low lung function to a variety of adverse health outcomes, and we certainly worry about a kid who may have a lower trajectory, and if they continue to stay low through the plateau and have a lower starting point, then they potentially are at our increased risk for some of these serious conditions later in life. So that was all about ambient air quality, high pollution, low com pollution communities. And at that point, we were getting these signals from NO2 and particles, et cetera. We really started to ask about maybe going more local within the communities, trying to tease apart <coughs> those pollutant effects and see whether we could identify a traffic-related signature on health. So there was some work done at UCLA at the time where they monitored close to the uh, San Diego Freeway, which is in Southern California, and uh, showed very convincingly that a variety of pollutants were uh, much higher near the, near the freeway and declined pretty 
sharply. So that means within our communities we had potentially some very highly exposed kids and much less exposed kids that might live further away. This is an example of one of the communities, Riverside, one of the high pollution communities. A couple freeways that are crisscrossing through town and the red dots are where the children's health study children live. And so you can see in this high pollution community some children are also exposed very locally to high levels of car and truck exhaust, whereas others are quite a bit further away and are going to be back at the background levels. And the background is not great in Riverside, but it's probably much better than the kind of double dose that these children are getting um, here. So uh, Rob McConnell had, had a paper showing that asthma prevalence was higher in children living very close to a busy road. There was work here that had looked at a variety of symptoms and related to traffic in the London area. This is a recent paper that was published last year, finding that rhinitis was increased in children that were living uh, or more exposed to traffic-related pollution. So we went at that point back to our two cohorts. We had, by the time we got to this point, we had eight years of follow-up on this second cohort. So we had a total then of about 3,800 kids or so, give or take, um, that we were able to use to try to tease apart these ambient versus traffic pollution signals. The other thing that worked in our favor is that when we started looking at proximity to roads of where the children lived, it broke down that we had about six communities where we had a high number of children that were within 500 meters of a busy freeway. And furthermore, if I show those, those six communities here, I uh, should say, on the map, you can see that some of them are in our high pollution communities, but we also have some that are in our low pollution communities. So it gives that potential exposure contrast uh, of being able to tease apart high pollution, high traffic, low pollution, high traffic, et cetera, all the combinations. When we looked at our lung function model, we saw a significant association between FEV growth and living close to a busy road, so relative to living at least 1,500 meters from a freeway in three categories, we saw a trend of decreased lung function <coughs> growth with increasing or decreasing distance to the freeway, I should say. Independent, again, of socioeconomic status, of smoking, secondhand smoke, asthma status, not just an LA problem at this point because as I pointed out we have kids in those outlying areas that are living close to busy roads. So we wanted to try to look then whether we could take those two exposures and the variation that we were seeing and, and ask this question about whether the effects were additive or not additive. And so we categorized our kids into four groups. Those that lived far from a freeway in a low PM 2.5 community. So that would be in the northern areas of the children's health study living far from a freeway. Compared to kids that were in a clean area but lived near a freeway, we estimated about a 4% decrease in eight-year lung function growth. Now if we contrast that with kids who live in a polluted community but they're far from the freeway, so they have one exposure but not the other, that was about a 5% decrease and if we put the two together, we saw nearly additive effects. So for those kids that live very close to a freeway in a polluted area, it was essentially the effects that we saw from the ambient plus the add-on effects that we saw from traffic. So we had done an early study um, to try to see what happened when kids moved away. And this was twofold. One, we wanted to make sure that we weren't seeing uh, attrition from our study that was somehow related to their ongoing health effects or their concerns about pollution and health and that we were not getting some biased attrition. But we also wanted to see what happened if they left a polluted community and went to a low pollution community, et cetera. So we tracked kids in the western states, flew out, did some lung function testing. We managed to get, uh, I think it was about 100 or so uh, that we could afford to do. And we saw some evidence that if the kid moved to a higher pollution community, they had a, a decrease in lung function growth. And if they moved to a lower pollution community, they had an increase in growth. So some suggestion that a change in air quality might be linked to uh, 
uh, a health effect. But what we really wanted to know was, what if the air in Los Angeles got cleaner, right where the kids have been living this whole time? What if we were able to clean up the air in the Southern California region? Would we be able to see an improvement in health effects? So we got a grant to study exactly that question. And I'll show you in a second, it happened at a very fortuitous time for us in terms of our data collection, that the state of California was putting in a number of aggressive policies to reduce air pollutant emissions from just about any kind of source you can think of. And I'll show you an example of some of those in a second. So there was a paper published by uh, some of my colleagues that looked specifically at the air quality trends over the last 20 or so years in Southern California. They documented a variety of policies that were put in place that affected ships, ship electrification, electric vehicles, cleaner fuels, cleaner automobiles, uh, newer and cleaner engines, restrictions on the kinds of trucks that were allowed to come down to the ports and pick up the goods. They had to have certain emission standards or they weren't even allowed to come in and pick up the goods from the ports. And in general, there were policies that affected on-road emissions, reformulating gasoline, off-road emissions, stationary point sources, and area sources. And all of these are different kind of regulatory programs put in by different kinds of agencies. But together, they came together. And in the face of, over that period, more traffic, increase in the economy, increase in the population, and increase in the port activity, we saw decreases in general in nitrogen dioxide levels, as much as about 50% decline. If you looked at some of our most polluted communities back in the early 90s, up around 30, between 35 and 40 parts per billion annual average, dropped down to somewhere below 20 parts per billion. Similar trends for PM 2.5, not really nearly the kinds of impacts on ozone, though. So I mentioned that we were lucky. I think in retrospect, we were very lucky here because we had recruited cohorts of children back in those more polluted times. We had this fifth cohort that was recruited later in time and importantly was followed during that growth spurt period from about, for us, age 10 or 11 on out to age 15. We were only able to afford, because of the grant funding, collecting lung function data on a subset of those kids over that age range, so from age 11 to 15, and as you'll see in a second, only in a subset of the community. So we reported on this a couple years ago, and the lung function testing was focused on only those five polluted communities that I pointed out in the beginning. So Long Beach, which has a high primary emission kind of pollution signature, and then our four inland communities that are kind of inheriting a lot of that pollution that's happening upwind. So if we look at those five communities specifically, and I've overlaid the four-year follow-up period for each of those cohorts, so the first cohort, the second cohort, and the third cohort, you can see that if you kind of mentally take an average of what are the kids breathing here, what are they breathing here, what are they breathing here, the cohort E kids, our fifth cohort, are breathing quite a bit better air than the two cohorts earlier on. For NO2, not so much for ozone, but certainly for PM2.5 and for PM10. So there's a lot of numbers here, but basically if we look community by community, the decrements in NO2 did vary a little bit from a decline of about 13% up to a decline of somewhere around 41%. Uh, for PM2.5, they were up around 40 to 50% declines, and you can see not quite as much for ozone. So when we line that up against the four-year lung function growth in the children in each of these communities, we observed in these five communities, for example, so if we look at San Dimas, one of our polluted inland communities, the average FEV growth for the first cohort, cohort C, is here, for the second cohort here, and for the third cohort is up here. And notice down here the, the, um, the axis is reversed, so going to the right now is, is improved air <coughs> quality. And you can see that in all five of the communities we see 
better lung function development in that last cohort that was breathing less polluted air. On average, the NO2 decreased by about 14 parts per billion, and lung function growth over that period increased by about 91 milliliters. And interestingly, that happened pretty consistently in all five towns. Now we see similar trends for, you guessed it, uh, NO2 and PM. So here's NO2, the one I just showed you, PM2.5, PM10, and then kind of a chaotic pattern going on with ozone and nothing statistically significant did we observe with ozone. But remember there was a less of an impact on ozone from all of these regulatory policies. So when we look at the actual effects both for FEV and FVC, they're all very statistically significant. Again, we see that package of pollutants kind of coming up again as being the important actors when we start looking at improved air quality. Um, can we distinguish those effects? Now we have another way of looking at air pollution. We're looking at air pollution improvements. Did that somehow give us a handle on being able to disentangle NO2 from PM effects? And the answer is really no. If you look at the correlations between NO2 decline and PM10 decline or PM2.5, et cetera, really high correlations and not the ability then to disentangle the independent effects of those again. Now, this was a little different, and we got really uh, taken through the ringer by our reviewers of this paper because they were very worried about all the other things that might have changed in cohort E, that third cohort, because a lot of things have happened in uh, a number of areas in terms of the changing dynamic of the population and different access to care and all those kinds of things. So we looked back, and cohort E certainly had become more Hispanic. Remember, in the early cohort, it was majority Caucasian. Now the majority was Hispanic. Um, cohort E had higher reported asthma, more insurance, uh, more air conditioning in the home, more gas stoves. But they had less of some of these other kinds of exposures. So for some reason over that 15-year period, fewer people were getting pets and cats and dogs and, and all that kind of stuff for whatever reason. Uh, so they're all potential confounders. Uh, if you go back to the initial e effect estimates that I showed you here, and I'll just focus on this one for NO2, the others come out to be pretty similar, we essentially threw everything we possibly could at it. So we took that estimate, we adjusted for education, we adjusted for insurance, we adjusted for a whole variety of things, including the date of the home construction, which one of the reviewers was interested in for some reason. Um, and you can see that if you kind of focus on the effect estimates, they're not really changing very much. So it didn't look like any of those factors that we knew had kind of changed from the early to the late time period were acting as confounders. So in general, the associations with cleaner air persisted even after adjusting for these. We've always been interested in subgroup effects. Remember I told you that was one of the initial kinds of foci of our hypotheses. So again, taking this kind of overall effect, we looked separately in boys and girls. We saw a, a higher effect in boys, but nothing that we would call significantly different from what we're seeing in girls. Remember, we have a large contingent of Hispanics in our sample. We were interested in whether there were differences there. We didn't see anything that was statistically significant. Um, quite a bit bigger signal in asthmatics. So some suggestion that improving the air might have a larger benefit for asthmatics than non-asthmatics. But remember, asthmatics are just a fraction of our sample size, maybe about 15% or so report having asthma. And so not something that we could definitively say was statistically different. Um, and then uh, we were worried a little bit about attrition, which we always are. So we focused on kids that had complete data over that time frame as a way to try to focus on you know, that sample where we had measurements uh, throughout, and we saw very similar effects there, suggesting that there wasn't some kind of a differential attrition from the study that might have led to biases in our, in our effects. So remember this picture that I showed you before from the earlier study where we were looking at abnormally low lung function related to levels of PM2.5, and rather than focusing on this side, I'd like to focus on this side for a second. 
So if we look at our lower pollution communities back then, about 2% of the children on average had abnormally low lung function. So that might be, in a sense, a target for what we would like to achieve um, of a proportion of kids that might be categorized in that, in that category. Uh, of course, people can have low lung function for a variety of reasons that have nothing to do with air pollution. So it's probably always going to be some fraction that is in that is in that category. Um, so we computed that then for our three cohorts that were in these particular five towns, and the proportion was about 8% in the first cohort, similar to what I showed you before. That's at the right-hand side of that plot at the beginning. The second cohort dropped a little, and the third cohort, we were down to about 3.5% that had abnormally low lung function at age 15 now at the end of this follow-up period. So it's not quite down to the 2% that we would have liked to have seen, but it's certainly a trend in the right direction. The other thing that um, we were concerned about was we didn't really have a control community, a community where the air pollution didn't change over this period. So it'd be another way to make sure there weren't kind of secular trends that were happening that were somehow improving lung function separate from anything to do with air pollution. And we tried to think about a way that we could address that without really having a true control community. And the only thing that we could come up with was that we did have a little bit of variation in how much improvement was happening in these communities. So for example, in Mira Loma, the, the red community here, we had a fairly large improvement. In Riverside, not so much. So it gave us an opportunity then to see how the magnitude of improvement might be related to the magnitude of change in air quality. And when we plotted those, so here's the amount of change in NO2. Notice Riverside, not as much, but also not as much change in lung function. Whereas the higher change communities had seemed to have higher changes in, in lung function, or bigger differences between the later cohort and the earlier cohorts. So if you kind of mentally draw a line through this, which I would never propose that you do, so don't do that, but if you did that, uh, it would kind of go through about the zero, zero line, suggesting that if we had a control community where there was no change in air pollution, we might expect to see very little change in lung function. But don't mentally draw that line. Um, we had a parallel investigation going on, directed by um, my colleague Carol Sperhani, who is looking at these changes in air quality and seeing if they were linked to s changes in symptoms. So we looked at a, a cluster of symptoms, bronchitis, cough, and phlegm, happening over a number of months, a suggestion that there was kind of chronic uh, lung symptomology going on. It's the same outcome that was used in those early McConnell studies to look at relationship between symptoms, and they were higher in asthmatics and trending with PM2.5. So when he looked at this, and here we had questionnaire data, we had a lot more data because we were able to collect questionnaires in all of our study communities. We saw similar kinds of trends where uh, decreased NO2 was related to a decrease here in prevalence of this, what we call BCP, bronchitis, cough, and phlegm outcome. Linked with NO2, PM2.5, um, and also observed both in asthmatics and in non-asthmatics. So for example, uh, NO2 and ozone, we now see some ozone signals, both at age 10 and at age 15 in asthmatics and non-asthmatics, and you can see a lot of statistically significant things here. So pretty much across the board, in addition to the lung function improvements, we see improvements in symptomology for kids over this period, decreasing with improved air quality. Similar kinds of trends, so the, the more improvements that were observed in the community, the bigger the reduction in the, in the number of symptoms. So when I started working with Chris and his team here, uh, he sent this picture around, which I found fascinating. So here's the United States, the variation in long-term exposure to uh, NO2 across our study communities. And it ranged from about 23 up to 39 parts per billion. The second cohort, on average, got a little bit cleaner, especially at the high end, and was a bit lower. Here's our third cohort, right? So now the higher end of our third cohort was at about 23. It was about where the lower end of our first cohort was. So pretty good 
improvements, about that 50% decrease. And London currently is out here, so the air quality around here is ripe for investigation, I would say, <laughs> right? So you got a lot going on. Some of these communities are, are w way up here. The average is somewhere down in here, but you can see still the average well above anything we've been observing even back 20 years ago. So the predicted changes due to this ultra-low emission zone that's being uh, put into place are, looks to be of the order, according to, to Chris uh, and his team, of about 50%. So similar to the kinds of improvements that we've seen in our study, uh, about a 50% improvement in our air quality over that time, a 50% improvement in your air quality is going to translate into uh, a lot bigger difference in absolute change. So certainly a very good opportunity, I think, to see health effects if those kinds of projections fall into place. So that's the question. So in general, uh, let me just wrap up, uh, tell you that after studying uh, air pollution and health effects for about 25 years in Southern California, uh, we do see associations with a number of chronic health effects. Um, we can say, I think at this point, that children in general are a susceptible group. We don't see a particular sex or asthma specific subgroup that is more uh, predominantly more sensitive, we, we pretty much see it across the board. Um, we've seen lung function and respiratory symptoms closely linked to traffic-related pollutants, NO2, PM, elemental carbon. Independent effects not really identifiable. Uh, we haven't made a lot of progress on that. And also, no real evidence of threshold effects, which is of big interest to, for example, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency who wants to set standards at a certain level and they'd like to know they've reached a, a place where they can say, okay, the air is now clean. And everything we've seen tends to support the view that you just want to get the air as clean as you possibly can and you'll continue to see health improvements. At least we haven't hit that threshold in Southern California uh, where we stop seeing improvements. Regional and local exposure is important. Um, so, in general, reductions in air pollution associated with measurable improvements in children's health. There were a couple papers published over the last uh, decade and a half or so also showing the, this kind of thing in adults as well, uh, improved symptomology in, in, um, uh, with reductions in, in air pollution. And so in California, there's this, you know, we're, we're of course, um, very interested to be able to kind of uncover these and, and have a role in supporting the regulatory process and the success that's happened in California. But we also have a little bit of a concern that people are going to get complacent and say, well, we've arrived. You know, we don't need to do much more. The cars are clean enough, the trucks are clean enough, et cetera. Uh, there are still some national standards that are not being met in some of those high pollution communities. So there's certainly work there to do to meet US EPA standards. Uh, certainly local pollution hotspots, those kids and, and adults that live very close to busy roads are still going to be breathing more polluted air than whatever the average is for that community. And, of course, more trucks and industry being projected for Southern California. So we know that future reductions in pollution are going to be difficult. They've been difficult to get to the point that we're at now, and they're going to continue to be a challenge. But Hopefully, the work that we've done has demonstrated that that hard work pays off in, in children's health. So with that, um, I will conclude, and uh, I welcome any questions you might have. Well, um, thank, thank you very much, Jim, for that uh, superb lecture, uh, for such a superb study, and I think, uh, for me, the saying, um, standing on shoulders of giants is, is <laughs> spot on because all my work has been inspired by your, your study. So thank you very much, personally. Um, we've, got, we've got some time for some questions. Um, I don't think we've got a um, microphone, so I'll We've got two microphones down here. Oh, so right, so right. Okay. Okay. that. Can I just I can speak loud. You can speak loud, yes. Testing. Uh, does that work? That sounds right. Yeah. Okay, right.
Thank you, that's very interesting. This, can you hear me? Okay, if you could just say who you are. Okay, I'm James Salmon. I'm an actual science teacher um, working in a school in West London. We're very worried about pollution because we're near a very main road. And it's more a political question. What levels of these pollutants do you think that London should get down to to minimise, with practical levels, the health threat to our children? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question was, uh, you know, what levels would I think London levels should get down to 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 um, protect the health of, of children? Um, I was looking a little bit at the at your standard of I think it's forty parts per billion. Is that right, Chris? Jonathan. Okay. 40, 40, uh, 40 micrograms, okay, so which is 20 21, parts per billion, 21, 20, 21 parts per billion. Um, if you could achieve that, that would be great, because you could see that that's the kind of where our last cohort ended up in our more polluted communities. It was about at 20, 22, 23 parts per billion on average. So at least you'd be kind of at the place where we've documented we're starting to see some improvements in our more polluted communities. Um, PM10 and PM2.5. So PM2.5 standard in the U.S. is now 12 micrograms per cubic meter uh, annual average, 35 micrograms per cubic meter 24-hour average, and we don't have an annual standard for PM10. There's an hour. There's a daily standard. So um, there was just a review done about three or four years ago for PM2.5 that ended up reducing the uh, the standard down to 12. Ian Sanderson, Pediatrics. I'm a little bit confused about the ozone. Um, you've shown that the towns which had a low pollution and the towns that had a high pollution didn't seem to have much difference in ozone. And also when pollution got better, there wasn't very much difference in ozone. Is, is ozone really a pollutant from traffic? So in Southern California, the answer is yes. Um, and it has to do with the meteorology in our area. So there's a lot of kind of hydrocarbon emission from the, the vehicles and industry, et cetera, and it kind of cooks in the afternoon sun. And so those inland areas have high levels of ozone because of that chemical process that happens. Um, a lot of the early regulatory uh, programs that were put in place were put in place to reduce ozone. And this was back in the 70s and the 80s. And that was because there was a lot of acute effect work on ozone showing that that was definitely a, a bad actor. So we suspect that um, you know, a lot of those kinds of controls had already been effective to reduce ozone. So by, by the time we started our study in the early 90s, uh, there was already probably per, quite a bit better ozone levels than there had been back in the 80s and the 70s. And a lot of the additional strategies were beginning to target these more direct emission kinds of sources to try to reduce those exposures. So they went in, I think, with the bias of trying to reduce NO2, NOx, et cetera, and they were fairly successful at that. Downstream, it didn't end up making that big of a change in the ozone levels. Thanks. Carol does to um, epidemiologist. Um, Thank you very much for such a clear exposition. I know your focus has been on lung development, but I wondered, given the changes in pollutants, whether there had been any corresponding change in preterm delivery prevalence um, in, in the area, and if there are any data on that. You know, that's not something we've studied, so I can't really comment about that, unfortunately, but that would be very interesting. And we have just started uh, a study we call MODRACE, which if I can remember what that acronym means, it's mother and something, 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 exposure. Um, and uh, it is to focus on pre-delivery exposures of the mother and early exposures of the child to do a variety of health uh, kinds of work on that and some epigenetic work as well. So we may get a little bit of a, a window under that, but we just don't have any data yet to look at. Okay, so um, if I understand your first question is, do we know anything about the 
the deposition of particles in the body or, or constituents of particles? Is that the question? Yeah. Yeah, we just, nobody has volunteered to give up their brain tissue yet, none of our kids, uh, and we haven't gone in and done those kinds of in more invasive studies, so we don't really have any first-hand data that can address that. For your second question, um, I didn't show much. At the very end, I mentioned elemental carbon, but we've also been tracking elemental carbon throughout the, the, the study as well, and that's in Southern California our best marker of diesel. Um, it tracks in terms of correlations very highly with, as you might expect, PM 2.5 and, and NOx. Um, so we haven't been able to necessarily distinguish that, but it's been associated with all of these health effects as we've been going through. Um, programs that have focused on diesel vehicles have been very rigorous in California, and I mentioned the, the port uh, and them forbidding older kind of black smoke belching diesel vehicles from even entering the port, so that really has uh, gotten a, a, a better fleet of vehicles on the road because they have to have a better vehicle to be able to do their work. Um, and I think that has been probably the, the most important change. Because also I mentioned um, regulations at the port itself, so these big ships come in and they would sit there for three or four days while the loads are being taken off belching, you know, bunker fuel uh, emissions. And so now some of the ports have put in electrification facilities, and so now these ships are able to plug in, and that's made a big difference. The on-port the on uh, vehicles have gotten cleaner, so the skip loaders that move all the, the uh, materials around were uh, not very clean, and they've gotten a lot cleaner. So it's really been a combination of all those things. There's a long list I showed there, and you know, in combination, that's, that's all contributed to improve uh, diesel emissions and then downstream levels of those related pollutants. Um, since we're not going to get a reduction in uh, traffic in the future in cities, how hopeful are you that a, a major conversion to electric power? Uh, you mean electrifying the cars? Yes. Um, yeah, I, well, I think it would probably make a big difference. Um, we have some of that that's gone on in California. There's been a move for people driving more and more Priuses and now Teslas and things like this. Um, so there's certainly been a move in that direction. But there's also been a very rigorous uh, new standards put in for just straight gasoline vehicles. So the the car you buy today is way, 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 way cleaner than even a car six, seven years ago. Uh, so it's really a combination of technologies, not only uh, geared at electrification, but also at the gas uh, burning vehicles and making those as clean as possible. Thank you for your detailed, understandable uh, presentation. And I totally, utterly no, don't understand because uh, uh, smoking cigarette campaign is uh, uh, tens and tens of years ago started. But ironically, America now, you know, uh, smoking cigarette is, uh, is uh, no good. But they constantly uh, imported, you know, cigar and cigarette from uh, Cuba. And then, especially last year, uh, in Paris, uh, you know, the, including the Obama, Barack Obama. He said, you know, the smoking cigarette is very bad because a lot of produce the carbon dioxide, but he is uh, almost all, you know, the, uh, the chain smoker. So why government, you know, the day, especially if you uh, smoking cigarette, you buy, you know, the uh, paper for the box, there was written, uh, smoking cigarette is uh, destroying your life. But why government don't control just policy to sell you know, the cigarette and cigar? Why constantly they doing a lot of money, you know, the spending, you know, the campaign? Why they don't do that? That is politics, you know, the, why don't you know the police uh, not to sell to the uh, cigar and cigarette? I I wondered that, especially America uh, want to little, but you know, they are constantly you know, the imported from you know the Cuba. So the question is. Cigarette smoking, um, is this still an issue? And are you uh, 
in Southern California? So uh, it, it's, does it still need action? It still needs action. Uh, and increasingly, what we've gotten interested in, and we're, we're doing health studies now, are, are e-cigarettes. Um, so there has been a decline in the number of kids that are taking up active tobacco smoking. But when you add together the kids that are smoking cigarettes plus those that are smoking e-cigarettes, it's about the same total as it was smoking regular cigarettes before e-cigarettes came into being. So uh, people can say e-cigarettes are healthier than regular cigarettes, but we see it as perhaps kind of a gateway towards uh, taking up active tobacco smoking and maybe uh, other kinds of uh, behaviors if they start on this path towards e-cigarettes. So we've been doing a lot of work trying to look at, at behaviors, uh, uh, programs put into place to try to reduce e-cigarette use. And so, yes, we're still very worried about that. But I have to say, the stop smoking campaigns, at least in California, that were put in place back when I was a kid, back in the 70s, were very effective at reducing the number of kids who took up smoking. So if you look at the smoking behavior now versus back in the 70s and 80s, it's, it's clearly been a, a huge impact. So there's not as much emphasis on new programs, no, new stop smoking programs for the kids these days, but there's more interest now in e-cigarettes and more kids taking that up. So there's starting to be some programs that are being put in place to <coughs> try to prevent that from happening. And we have time for one more question. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Ian Rowe, I'm a registrar for the Calgary Star in Chicago, <coughs> London. Um, I was interested, thank you for this elegant study, it's really wonderful piece of work. Um, I was interested in what you said about the deficit for children who are considered to be outdoorsy and how you might frame that in a public health context around the benefits cardiovascularly and in terms of BMI and how that links with lung function and overall health. Yeah, that's a great question. So. Um, we worried about that message when we first put this out because, of course, we want kids to go outside and, and exercise. So we saw it more as a, um, a suggestion that outdoor air was having an adverse effect on kids' health. We tried to play up that angle of it that here's another piece of evidence that, you know, yes, the kids that are outdoors breathing whatever is in their community is having a health impact. But in the same breath, we would turn that around and say, but we're not saying don't go outside and play. Uh, just maybe be a little cautious about where you play. So for example, if you have the option of playing at a park right near a freeway or a park that's a ways away, you know, maybe you want to choose the, the park that's a ways away. So you know, that, that message has continued. We're now very interested in pollution and obesity effects. Uh, and you know, so we're, we're trying to play both sides here and make sure kids are getting activities, you know, reducing their chance of being obese, but having those activities in clean places, which, you know, have to say the only way to really do that is to clean up the air because you're not going to change individual kids' behaviors when they want to be on a soccer team and the team plays by the freeway. You know, the, the kid's going to play by the freeway. Thank you very much. If permit me one comment. I think that bronchitis uh, signal is obviously very interesting to us who are interested in the microbiome because it implies mm -hmm some sort of interaction between bacteria in the lower yeah. airway or alterations. And I think you've been reporting this for vaping as well, some uh, increased bronchitis. So you wonder whether there may be some sort of commonality between um, mechanisms. Yeah, going abso down. absolutely. So some, some kind of a systemic uh, response that's, that's being kicked into gear. Yeah. So yeah. we're very interested in starting some of these you know, omic studies that we talked about earlier today as well. Try and you know, understand more about the biology of what's going on. What would prevent London from achieving the successes that you've seen uh, in California? Um, you know, well, I guess what I can do is, is think a little bit about what made the success in California and, and California, if you don't know, is a very liberal state. Um, we're a blue state, a left-wing state, and in general, uh, for whatever reason, the population has always been very environmentally conscious. And so, when you, you bring out some health effects and you and you show, you know, pollution is bad for this or water pollution is bad for that, people take notice and they form action communities. And we've worked with with a local. 
Action Committee in Long Beach and Riverside and all around, and they're very in tune with the health impacts and they're very connected to their local community. So I think that was, has been really important because then that feeds up through the legislative chain to continue the pressure to put in place some of these programs. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of a multi-tiered. I think it has to come certainly from the, um, the government putting out the policies and the money to put these policies into play, but then it's very important to have kind of the grassroots interest to keep that pressure up and to be enthusiastic about implementing those and show the general populations in those communities that implementing these things, which are not always pleasant, um, that they're good in the long term. Mm, yes. so. Okay, we must stop there. I'm sure that hopefully you're going to ask a question here. No. <laughs> we'll stop there and uh, I'm sure you will join me in uh, giving Jim a huge vote of thanks for an extraordinary story and an extraordinary commitment on the part of himself and his team to the cause of uh, better air quality but uh, ultimately better health uh, for children. So thank you Jim, it's a huge pleasure to have you thank and you. thank you. Thank you again. For